Uh, this morning, our topic is, What a Mighty God We Serve. Uh, if you turn to your, your Bibles to the book of Daniel, the first chapter. Daniel chapter 1, and uh, we're starting in verse 6, uh, Daniel, the, the first chapter, beginning in the, in the sixth verse. Uh, we're not talking about the, uh, the book of Daniel, but there are a couple of points I wanted to, uh, to share in uh, context of what we are, are discussing. The first chapter of Daniel, the sixth verse, it says, Now amongst these, speaking of the, uh, the Jews that were brought into captivity, there were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so these uh, Hebrews were brought into captivity under Nebuchadnezzar. And when he went in, there were several plunders that were made against Jerusalem. But in the first, the first one there uh, was Daniel and his companions, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Uh, the trek back from Jerusalem to, to Babylon was well over 500 miles. And they marched through the desert. And he wanted the, the, the wisest, the strongest, uh, the bravest. And so he took of these youth there. And there in the tutelage of his, uh, his servants, the men, young men, and some scholars estimate Daniel was maybe 16 or 17 uh, years of age, his companions close to that age in proximity. So if you'd imagine being taken away from your homeland, and, and here you're going to a, a foreign land, and there your, your father, mother, sisters, brothers, that no one is there with you. Uh, t totally, entirely different. They the clothing that you are used to seeing is not there. The food that you're used to eating is not there. Uh, the language that you're used to hearing is uh, spoken, but to a small or to a mixed or uh, limited degree. When you've traveled overseas, you know that the, uh, the, the smell of the air is even different in different places. And so here they are in this uh, nation, and they have been selected because of their, uh, their, their splendor in, in respect of the ability that the king saw and then to be able to mold them to who he wanted them to be. And so it is very important that the Bible says, that first off, that these were their names, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The names amongst the Hebrews were sacred. They were held in sacred trust. And when the parents would name their children, it was typically after attributes that they wanted them to, to occupy or to have. And so they would study the behavior uh, for several days and to see um, how they moved, how they acted, how they responded. And, of course, then there was this burden, this yearning, of having certain attributes to be exhibited amongst them. And so maybe uh, if there was a, a, a promise that was given uh, for a child being born, as in the case of Isaac, when Isaac's mother heard this, uh, she laughed. She said, you know, shall I, um, being old, uh, have pleasure with my Lord and have a child? And so she laughed at the, the angel. Therefore, then, when the child was born, the child's name was Isaac, uh, meaning laughter. So there would be names that would be uh, some symbolic of their experience. And so Daniel uh, had the name which meant God is judge. Hananiah was the gift of the Lord. Mishael meaning who is like God or who is like Yahweh. And then Azariah whom Jehovah helps. These godly names as such they were conferred upon them. But when they come to Babylon the king decided that he wanted to give them new names. Uh, he had changed their attire, their appearance. And names were befitting of changing them as well. And this was to, to be a process of moving them from where they were to where he wanted them to be. And so they received these names. And it is interesting that we don't see a, a, quote, refusal of the names. Because names don't make a person who they are. Meaning the parents wanted these attributes to be seen in their children. And they prayed earnestly for those things. But just naming the child won't do that. You know, there are people uh, today in the Hispanic culture, the name Jesus. But, but they're not Jesus, and they certainly understand that they're not. And maybe they could want to hope to be, and they could be Christ-like, uh, but they could never be Jesus. And so Daniel had this name, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The names were, were important amongst them, and, and Nebuchadnezzar sought to change their names. And so he gave them these uh, Babylonian names. He gave to Daniel the name of Belshazzar, which means the prince of Baal. Shadrach, servant of sin, or the moon god, and Meshach uh, was who was a coup-like. Then there was Abednego, meaning a servant of Nebo. 
The names were changed to, to honor the deities that were around them, but this did not uh, influence these men that were there. They still stayed true and faithful to Jehovah despite the names that they were given in this land of captivity. Now in Psalms 107th Division, in Psalms 107th Division, and beginning in verse 10, uh, though they had received these names there, the names, of course, again, uh, they did not change their behavior. The Bible says that a, that a good name is rather to be chosen than riches. And so the name then that was conferred upon them from their parents, they, they held true to this lineage as to they wanted to be one that was like God. Uh, they would look to Jehovah for help. They recognized that they were God's gift there, still even in Babylon, and, and they revealed who God was to those that were around them. In Psalms 107th Division, and beginning in verse 10. In Psalms 107th Division, and beginning in verse 10, speaking of the distress of the children of Israel, says that such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against what? Uh, the word of the Lord. They rebelled against God's word and therefore they were held in captivity. They contemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore it says in verse 12, he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and they had no help. The plight of the Israelites was of such that when they would get haughty and high and lifted up, then God would have a way of, of humbling them. And so when we look in the experience of the Israelites as they go into captivity, it was God's way of seeking to humble them, to, to draw their attention from the earth to the things of eternal reality. And so these men, they were there, and the nation would later on, some of them would come into captivity. And it's still a principle that God sometimes uses adversity uh, to humble us. Now when we look at the experience of, of blacks in uh, the issue of slavery and coming to America, I want to be, again, clear uh, that blacks were not cursed, and thus they went into slavery. And there's some books that you might come across, and sometimes the inference is, is, is that, uh, that, that these were savages, and these were pagans, and, and therefore God cursed them. He, he, uh, he, he brought about slavery to be able to humble them. Sometimes God uses means and methods that we sometimes do not understand. Uh, he sometimes allows affliction to come to us, but yet we understand that the Lord doth not willingly afflict nor grieve um, the hearts of the children of men. Uh, it, it is though whenever he has to execute and to bring forth judgment, it is, it, it is a, uh, a, dil a difficult situation at best. Because the, the Lord does not desire then to, uh, to, to have us to be afflicted. It, it's not something he looks forward to. It's a chastening process. But nonetheless, it is one that he allows to happen because he, he wants our best good. He has our, our best good in mind. So when these brothers and sisters were brought, approximately 12.7 million uh, were stolen from their homeland. And they were brought over in the middle passage, and of course, the number did not make it. It's estimated that 10.7 million made it over uh, from the passage, and so over a million died in the passage over. Uh, but in America, there were about 600,000. Uh, that ended up making it here. The rest of the slaves and that number of that population ended up being in parts of the uh, Caribbean, etc. But the 600,000 that made it here uh, would live in fetters and chains and be shackled. And you look in the, in the 1870s when slavery came to an end, there were 4 million, 4 million blacks that were under the institution of slavery. But again, I said that there were 600,000 that came. Well, how did you get such a dramatic and populist growth. When you look at slavery, you know that it is a very evil institution that, that was there. I will submit that most of them, that a number were brought about by uh, the slave masters forcing themselves upon these innocent sisters. The men that were brought up uh, had no ability to be able to protect themselves. Uh, children were sold off from their parents. Uh, husbands were sold from their wives. Wives were taken ad advantage of. And men who would sometimes would object, they would, would be beaten uh, savagely and viciously. If you've what, read or seen Alex Haley's classics on, on Roots, you know that there were some that had the, ter the thirst for freedom. Uh, and they were willing to, to risk everything to be able to go. And these were, were people who were held in bondage and captivity. I read recently of the, the slave Bible. The slave Bible was interesting in that the 90% it is estimated of the Old Testament is missing in that Bible. 
50% of the New Testament is missing. And putting it another way, one writer says that it was, there are 1,189 chapters that are in the standard Protestant Bible. But in this slave Bible, that the, it, there were only 232 chapters. So you can understand that it was drastically changed. It had been drastically removed. Uh, and why would this be? Well, it was removed, some of these things, because they, if, if you read the Old Testament in its entirety, or if you looked at the New Testament in its entirety, you, you would understand and see there a God that does not condone the system then of one man owning another. You would see then a system of a God of mercy that was always there for his people. You would see the cry of the Israelites as they were in Egypt when their cry went out to God for deliverance that he raised up a deliverer, a man by the name of Moses, and that by a mighty and an outstretched arm that God moved in, in a hundred different ways to bring out this downtrodden race. So they felt that, well, if people were able to read that, if they were able to see that, then it might inspire with them the same confidence and the same hope. And so that was not something that would be desirable. And, then of course, you'd read in the Old Testament of where if a man, quote, unquote, owned a slave, and he did something, and he smote the slave, and the slave's tooth were chipped. His tooth was chipped, then the slave would be able to be free. But they kept passages in that said the slaves, uh, servants, obey your masters. Because those seem to, uh, to augment or to support their cause. But the, the vast majority was taken away. And it is interesting that, that in, it was under this dilemma and under this situation that there were missionaries that went through in the Caribbean. And, and in this, their small uh, portion of the Bible, uh, that they were still able to offer and to share Christ with some who did not know. Now again, there are, are, are tons of people who came over who were Christians already. So again, don't go from the, the aspect of saying, well, these are savages and these are heathens that did not know God. The Christianity had already been introduced into, uh, into Africa years ago. If you turn over to the book of, of Acts, you turn over to the book of Acts, you can read through the Bible, but just to give you one place to turn, uh, turn in the book of Acts. Uh, God had a means of being able to reach out into uh, to share so that people might know and that they might be able to understand. In the book of Acts chapter 8, his hand was upon all people, and his hand in particular was also upon those who did not know. You read in the uh, book of Solomon, uh, the, the writings of Solomon, that the uh, queen of Sheba came by uh, to visit with Solomon. There she had a knowledge of him because she said, well, when I was in my land, the half of all uh, has not even been told me. And blessed are those that are in your presence that they might hear the words of, of your instruction. So she was able to go back and to tear and to retain a knowledge of, of God therein. Now in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, the 8th chapter, and the 26th verse, it says that the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Rise and go toward the south. I'm reading in verse 26, Acts chapter 8 and verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south into the way that goeth down from Jerusalem into Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of what nation? Of Ethiopia. Now, if you're not familiar with the map, then I'll just help you out very quickly. Ethiopia is a country that is in, in Africa. A man that was there, an Ethiopian, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. So here is this man that is in high rank, in high ranking official. And the Candace is the queen. And, and, and I know that you watch a lot of uh, television. And sometimes the, uh, the, the television has a way of... Um, shall I say, whitewashing history. And so you look and you think everybody is white. No, everybody's not white that's uh, in the Bible. Uh, and, and there are, are people of color uh, who, again, when you look at, at the history uh, that was there, these are uh, people who were, uh, who were smart, who were intellectual, who were gifted and blessed of God. It, those who do not know their history, they are, are damned to repeat it. You see, if people understood, they, 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 the slave master wanted people to think uh, that they were just brutes and heathen. And therefore, it would have a way of being able to overlook and to gloss over the treatment that he was rendering to them. Because after all, he was taking them from a savage nation and giving them the influence of Christianity. But the version of Christianity that he was bringing was truly not a biblical-based version of Christianity because the Bible version of Christianity, Jesus says, and you ought to treat another man in the same capacity the way that you would want to be treated. And so you could not embrace uh, truly Christianity because to embrace Christianity would also be able to recognize that racism, sexism, is a sin. And that a brother that is regardless of the different hue or sister of the different hue, then they are, we are equal in the sight of God. 
So they didn't want them to have that knowledge of Christianity, but they wanted them to have a, a warped perception that, that placated them because these were the same men that would sexually assault the woman and then on Sunday be in church uh, singing hallelujah. And they were fine with it again as long as certain things were read uh, from the scriptures that would placate them and the, the sermons that those slaves would often hear were just to obey your your master and, and the mistress and whatever they do. But the Bible says in Acts chapter 8 and verse 27, it says that there was this man of great authority uh, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. And, and so there, there's royalty there, um, beloved kings and, and queens. You come from a line then of kings and queens and princes and princesses. Candace was the queen of the Ethiopians who had charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem to worship. Notice that it doesn't say that he had come there to learn of God. Rather it says that he came there to worship. Meaning that he knew of God already. He understood of God. He had heard of his authority. They were not worshiping um, sticks and so forth. Now, now again, I'm not suggesting that that did not exist because there were certainly places that it did exist. Uh, but the notion that, that this is a whole continent that is given over to idolatry and people do not know, then that's certainly a, a that is not even a misnomer, that's just a fabrication. This man that was there thousands of years prior, that he went to Jerusalem there to worship because he had known and understood the knowledge of God had been spread abroad. And so he wanted to go up there to worship. And so as he goes to worship, it says in verse 28 that as he was returning, that he was sitting in his chariot and he's reading Esaias the prophet. Now, another thing I want you to know is that the man could read. Uh, he, he was not illiterate. He was able to read and understand that which he read. Now, in, in the system and the institution of Slavery, uh, you know that it was illegal to teach a black person how to read or write. That if you taught a black person to read or write, then you would be lashed for it and you could even also be punished or put to death. The black that was on the receiving end of the lesson, then that they would be severely beaten and possibly put to death. They wanted to keep blacks in ignorance. And so if you were in ignorance, then you wouldn't know or desire something better. But yet in the, the spirit of man, because we've been formed in God's image, there is a desire that is there for freedom. There is a desire there to be able to be liberated, even though there were chains that bound them. There was an indomitable spirit that rested in the heart, and that heart yearned towards freedom. And they would learn so more, uh, more, more thoroughly of the ways of God. They would learn that there is a God that is able to identify with them. And so when we look back at this experience here, this man uh, was literate. He was able to read, and he's sitting down, he's reading Isaiah the prophet. As he's reading through it, he doesn't quite understand what he's reading. It says in verse 29, that the Spirit said to Philip, go and to join yourself to this chariot. Uh, there's also something here to understand, uh, that, that in the sight of God, he's, he's not divided up as we get divided up. He sees people that are his children, he sees a person that is in need, not, not the skin color. Uh, and and it's, it's okay to see black people and white people and so forth, but, but you still need to see beyond it. You need to see this is the human race. So he, he looks and he sees them, and so God sends the spirit there. And, and Philip goes, and you also need to understand then that, that, that amongst not all Jews, but many of the Jews, and the, there was this uh, wall that had been built up, a wall of partition between them and between the Gentiles. And so they saw the, the Gentiles as being... Uh, there as being a problem, and so they did not normally want to associate with them. But when, but when the Spirit says go, then who is man to say no? So the Spirit now moves upon Philip to go to this Ethiopian and be able to teach him. And, and I believe also uh, the God Spirit will move upon you to go and to sit down and to teach someone. They might look a little different than what you might anticipate. But when the Spirit says go, then, then you go. And they might not live up to the standard as what you understand, what I understand of Christianity, but if they're looking and they're thirsting and they're searching after God and the Spirit bids and beckons to go, then, then you and I must also sit down and we must but go. 
So the wall of partition that had been built up, Jesus came by his life, by his death, to be able to tear it down. That's what the New Testament teaches us. He came to break that down. So text in Galatians that there's no difference between Jew and Gentile, male or female, the bond of the Gentile. Those weren't in the slave Bible. Because yeah, you come across that and that would be a rebellion. But this man was learned, and the Spirit moves upon Philip to go unto him. And it says in verse 30 that Philip ran to him. And he heard him read the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah is what it is, or Esaias. And he said, it, understand what you read. Right? Now this is not talking about that the man was illiterate, because the man could, was reading. But, but, but he wasn't able to understand the totality of what he was reading. You know, you, you've read books before, and it's like, you know, I don't get it. You open it up and it's, you know, some plain English and you're reading over and it's just, you read it one time and you don't get it, you read it second time, third time, fourth time, it just seems as though it might as well be in Russian because you don't understand a word that they're saying. But then somebody else comes along and they read and they say, oh, this is what it's saying. And so now it is that, that, that Philip is reading, he's, not, he's reading through the scrolls. And as he's sitting down reading, he's reading about Isaiah, and he doesn't understand really who he's talking about because he doesn't know if, if this is Isaiah or if this is somebody else that he's talking about. Notice it with me. It says in verse 31, it says, that How can I, except that some men should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he read was this one, that he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, like a lamb that is dumb before his shearers, so he opened not his mouth, and in his humiliation his judgment was taken away. And, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And now Philip is asked a question. Is this man talking about himself, or is he talking about somebody else? And so it was in that Philip took the opportunity then to, um, to explain to this eunuch that the man who he's talking about is a man named Jesus of Nazareth. And it takes the time to be able to teach him and to, to, to make it simple and plain so that, that he can understand. You, there, there are people who, who read the Bible today, but they, they still don't understand uh, the basic, you know, who is Jesus of Nazareth? That he gave his life upon the cross to be able to save them. That no matter what sins they have done, that he stands willing, able, and ready to forgive. That he will cleanse them of all their transgression and give them a new life by faith that they will look to him. That he is more than willing, he's graciously invites man, that he is not um, a God that is, is angry with them, but a God that is moved with love and compassion to save unto the uttermost. And so when Philip is now, he has this broken down there explained to him, uh, or rather Philip explains it to the eunuch. And a eunuch, of course, as you know, then this was a, a person that had been uh, castrated. So they would oftentimes, uh, in the Hiram, they would have men that were there, and they wanted the men to be able to make sure that the, the queen or the princesses or whoever, uh, that they were protected and that they were no fooling around. And so they would, they would take men and castrate them. And this is what, what Daniel's lot. Daniel then was a eunuch. He had been castrated then. And so that simply means, because some people are like, what does castration mean? Uh, it, it means that, 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 that the... Um, Best way to describe it for you and still uh, to be appropriate. It simply meant that, uh, that, that he was still a male. Um, however, uh, because uh, of this surgery or procedure, his sexual urges, his desires uh, were not there. So therefore, then it was no, had to worry about the, the queen being around because the guy wouldn't be interested in the queen. And so maybe, maybe they did that today. <laughs> It'd be an interesting thing uh, that, that would happen uh, if that were, were to take place today. You see, uh, all, all not mutiny. Uh, because of the dyers, God gave those to man. Uh, but they, they wanted to protect and to make sure that nobody would bother. And so this was a, a, a eunuch. Daniel was a eunuch. Um, the, the three Hebrews, they were brought up in that way. In fact, the Bible prophesied of that. And then when we read out in Acts chapter uh, 8, this man received the gospel now. And guess where he goes? He's going to go back down now to Ethiopia. Going to go back down now and to be able to share. Now notice it goes on to say in verse, uh, 30, uh, verse 36, it says, And as they went on their way that they came to water, and the eunuch said to her, Here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, Yes, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. And they went down and they were baptized. And verse 39 says, And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away 
Philip and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. So the eunuch is going to go back down to Ethiopia. And there again, of course, the knowledge of God will be conveyed and will be shared out. God is showing that he is not a respecter of persons. Regardless of the nation that a person is in, he is not a respecter of persons. And, and, and though America is the, I believe, the most blessed nation upon the earth, uh, we should not get so haughty in the field that we are above other people. Uh, you look at the uh, immigration issue that is here in, in, in the states and how uh, some people say, well, just uh, you treat people with any kind. No, you, don't, you, you treat people still with dignity. You treat them with respect and the same, and that whole thing of the golden ruler rings true, that you treat a person the same way that you want to be treated. So you treat them with a person with dignity and with respect, and regardless of if they have, quote, broken a law or not broken, they still are treated with respect, with decency. It is what God then would require and what he would ask to be given. So this Philip, uh, this, uh, Philip is faithful to the call and to the task of God. He goes and he shares, and now the gospel goes back now again to Ethiopia, that, that it may be shared, um, that it might be broadened, that people might know and that they might understand. Well, Psalm said that the Israelites, when they were in trouble, uh, it was because of their um, backsliding ways. Submit that, that why did God allow such a cruel institution to exist. You know, frankly, I don't have an answer. But it's the same question to ask then, to, you know, well, why does God allow uh, hardship and suffering? We, we know in the big picture that he's allowing men to be able to, to demonstrate the wickedness that they are involved in. But still, why does he allow suffering? Why does he allow then the, uh, the two-month-old child to die? in front of his parents. And the parents pray for healing and the healing does not come. Why does he allow the person that is 20 years old to perish? Why does he allow the drunk driver to live and the victim to be killed and to be buried? So you don't have answers to those things, but the context of the scriptures still rings forth the message still that God is loving. We still don't understand all the things, but we understand, though, in the by and by that God will be able to understand or rather to explain to us those things that we did not grasp, but that bothered us or maybe that troubled us. And we learned then that we still hope in spite of. And so then to the millions that were in slavery, they were not there because they had been cruel and that they had rebelled, but they were there simply because of the avarice and the greed of man. They were there because they were influenced by the devil to go and to do this work. And most of the nations, many of the nations, they were involved in this, this work. And so as blacks then began to hear, even through, quote, the slave Bible, and missionaries began to come. And there were, through the Great Awakening, some of the southern masters began to have their heart open to at least let their slaves hear. So when they went and began to share, there were songs and stories that began to resonate. We, we re sung one of the spirituals this morning. We've been singing some of the spirituals through and through, and they, they begin to see a similarity there. And the Bible tells us in the book of St. John chapter 8, and we need to move very quickly in St. John chapter 8, they begin to see a similarity. It was in, in the songs that they begin to sing, because again, they were not able to read. They couldn't even read the Bible. But they would hear the stories of what was told, and then they learned about a man named Jesus. And what attracted them to Jesus again was not only who he was, but the way that he was treated while he was upon the earth. That, that he was the king of kings, but, but men spit in his face. That he was the king of glory, and yet men whipped his back. That he was God manifest in the flesh, and yet he allowed sinful men to hang him upon the tree. So they were able to identify because they looked at their plight when they were spit upon, when they were beaten, uh, when they were lynched, hung upon trees and beaten upon trees and were able to identify and to see that this is a God that is very, in fact, similar just as to we are. And they uh, hope began to spring up. In John chapter 8, the Bible tells us in verse 32 that you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Now this is a, a profound statement that Jesus is making because he's talking about it in the sense of spiritual liberation. Talking about, but, but you shall know the truth 
And the truth shall set you free. Because you see, the Bible explains to us in that we are a captive held captive by Satan. And so there may not be physical chains that we look upon. There may not be fetters of iron that bind the feet or that bind the, the hands. But then when you can't control yourself, you're but a slave. Uh, when you say that, oh, I just can't help it, then that means that I'm just but a slave. I, I don't have the ability, it just, just comes over me and I don't know what to do. And what Jesus was dealing with with man was that, look, do you shall know the truth and the truth it shall set you free. And that's when the Jews heard this. There was a problem that was there because they look and you can see the verses that surround it. They said, well, look, how can you talk about us being free? We haven't been indebted to anybody. They, they, you know, like, like folk today. Folks today walk around as though they are they're free, not realizing um, that if you don't serve Jesus, then you're still in bondage and servitude. Now, again, there's no, no chains that, that clank as you walk down the street. And just as we learned in the story of the day, there's no devil that appears and that has hoofs uh, and horns upon his head and a tail on his back. You know, if he walked around like that, uh, people would take notice. We're told an inspiration that really he, he wants people to think that he is like that. In fact, he's even better inspired when people believe he does not even exist. But if he can make you think that that's how he appears and that's how he looks, then guess what? That's how you're going to look for him in that form and that fashion. But you won't look for him when he comes in uh, with a nice press suit and Calvin Klein or Brute. When it looks nice and smells nice, you won't think of them in that regard. Um, but when they come as a silver-tongued serpent, uh, the disguise is there. And so they looked and said, we're not in bondage to any man. And so how can you then therein say that we shall be free? And so the spirit of the slaves, it was an indomitable spirit where well, they wanted something called freedom. And it's interesting that even when they were brought into captivity and were born into captivity and never knew what freedom was, they still desired it. How can you want something that you've never had? It, it was just from the, the understanding and being able to see those things in nature that, that bespeak of God's love as infinite power. They, they wanted to be free, and so they began to sing songs because, again, they could not read. They were unable to write. And, and when they gathered together, it was generally for a short amount of time, and even those things were monitored, so they had to find ways to be able to talk and to share and to express their gratefulness to God because they were, they were learning about more and more about God. And, again, some of them already knew. Others were being told, but they began to hear about the Israelites. And they learned, and as we read in Psalms, that, that in their captivity, they turned to God and they cried and God heard them. And so the thought began to resonate that maybe if we were turned to God, because we have no earthly help, but if we turn to God as well, and if our cry goes out, if our plea goes out to God, then maybe the same God that delivered Israel, just maybe he might raise up a deliverer for us and also grant us deliverance and freedom out of this cruel land that we live in. So they begin to sing songs. Some of those songs... Have you sung before? One of the songs, of course, was Go Down Moses, uh, way down in Egypt land, and tell old Pharaoh uh, to let my people go. Now, when they were singing that song, of course, the slave master not really necessarily paying attention to what's going on. His, her intent was just, are they working the field? So you, you just imagine in the hot sun with an overseer there. And they're singing as they are picking cotton. They're singing as they are plowing and laying down tobacco. They're singing in their oppression, let my people go. Tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And they also understood then that Pharaoh was a symbolic then of the slave master that they were held under his domain. And that just as the Pharaoh of old and antiquity would not let Israel go except there was a great deliverance, then this Pharaoh also would not let Israel go. And they also then used to sing songs of swing low, sweet chariot, uh, coming for to carry me home. As they sung that song, then they were looking for freedom across the Jordan. They understood the Jordan as being sometimes having to cross literal rivers to be able to get through to freedom. And they learned that you follow the North Star. If you could follow the North Star up far enough, then you would be, you would be free. And so these songs and these scriptures from the Bible then that spoke of God's deliverance, they began to have 
um, a hope that inspired them that they would be willing to go and to risk all. They learned from the scriptures in that they were the children of God. And these were people who had been treated as property. And as they began to hear certain things, they learned that, that we're not property. We've been formed in the image of God. We're his children. One of my favorite songs was that they used to sing, All of God's children got shoes. I got shoes, you got shoes, all of God's children got shoes. Now again, you, that doesn't mean much to us because you've you got like 20 pi pairs of shoes. Um, but when they, were, when they were singing it though, they didn't have a pair of shoes. They didn't have clothing, they didn't have food. But, but they were talking about not just having a quote a pair of shoes, this was all a, a spiritual meaning. Shoes to be able to walk in God's kingdom. And then they talked another song that said that everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. Now, these were songs that they were being able to sing just to kind of lift each other's spirits up, to be able to encourage them then to, to hold fast to God, that God is not going to abandon us. God will not leave us. He will not forsake us. And so as these songs begin to resonate, they begin to build more hope and more courage, more confidence in God, that God was able to do something for them. And so he was speaking unto them. And so now they wanted freedom. Again, this was the spiritual freedom, but also physical freedom as well. And so I submit to us today as we, as we conclude, in Galatians chapter 5, the Bible therefore speaks of the freedom then that we must enjoy. Uh, to be able to live and to honor and a greater extent, a greater legacy, because you can be free without having chains around you, but if you are still um, held captive by Satan, then you are just a servant. The Bible says, know you not to whom you yield yourself servants to obey his servants, ye are to whom you obey, whether sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. And so when a man or a woman cannot control themselves, then I would submit, then you need Jesus. Attitude takes the best of us, then I would submit that you and I need Jesus. Our lust and passions cannot be contained by ourselves, I would submit then that we need Jesus. You don't have the right words to be able to say. It just seems as though someone agitates you and you just curse them out. When I would say then, then we need Jesus. Because a man that has been set free, it says in Proverbs chapter 5, that whatever we don't overcome, that invariably it also overcomes us. And so the irony is, is that these slaves, as you go to Galatians chapter 5, many of them were freer uh, than the masters that held them into captivity. And so they look forward to a day, a day of liberation. And they also understood that that, that day may never come. Not everyone held the hope that one day that they would be free upon this earth. Because many, from the time they were born to the time that they died, they only knew one thing, the fear of the master's whip. But they still sung a song about crossing over the Jordan River. So the Jordan to them was a symbol then of death, that when they died then, that they hoped then, that then at least they would be at freedom. And they looked forward to the day in which Jesus would come, in which the lion would lie down with the lamb. And that they should both eat grass as an ox. The serpent and adder would not harm at all. They looked forward to then this day, and it is also still a burning bright day, but we can only have that by liberty and freedom in Jesus Christ. It says in Galatians chapter in verse 31 it says so then brethren we are not children of the bond woman but we are children of the free he uses a previous allegory to talk about those that are under bondage and those that are free and still today there are men that are enslaved and, and we haven't even talked of the the cruelty of the sex trade of the thousands of children boys and girls that are in foreign countries, but have given over to the vile appetites of human beings. Their cry still goes out to God, and in the same capacity, God still looks and he sees the evil that exists upon the earth. And with a strong arm, he will bring forth deliverance. But we, beloved, in the meantime, we must be free. It says that if you are of the bondwoman, then you're not free. Verse 5, uh, chapter 5 and verse 1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty, wherewith Jesus Christ has made us free. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And so God has set us free when you call upon him. Because he has set you free, um, then you have a work to do. 
Uh, Harriet Tubman, one of the uh, leaders of the Underground Railroad, was called uh, Moses. Some called her the Black Moses. In fact, some didn't even know if she that she was a woman at all. Well, they thought that she was a, a male. And she didn't stand too tall. She was maybe like five, one or five, two. Um, but when she had freedom, uh, she felt, felt that she couldn't be free until her, her brothers and her sisters and her, her mother and her father, that they also were free. And so even though she was in Philadelphia, she said, I have to go back down south to be able to let my people uh, be free. One of the things that, that inspired her was that when she looked at the Underground Railroad, that it was a system uh, that was there. And it was, you know, multiple ways that, that slaves could be able to escape the freedom. Again, I told you there were some really good white folks that helped blacks during that time. You know, you, you don't get out just by pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. There, there, there's someone that is there always willing to be able to, to assist you. Rather than getting a hand out, uh, some like to say it's a hand up. So never forget where you've come from and always leave the door open behind you for somebody else to be able to come along. But she looked at all these different ways that, that slaves could be able to get to freedom. And, and, and the great quandary was there. Well, were there all these ways, these avenues, and again, these, those that risked their lives to entertain um, blacks, they did so at the risk of their lives and all that they possessed. You know, you talk about the Quakers and, and, and just other really good folks uh, that, that said that this institution they would not stand for. They were willing to sacrifice and to give themselves for a cause that was held to them to be much more um, sacred um, than that. But she said, I can't be free until my family is free. So I bid you that today as we, as we close that, that in the freedom that we enjoy in Jesus Christ, when we can help other people to be liberated, God calls us also to help them that they too may be free. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you again that you walk beside us every single day. We thank you that you have, have never left us nor forsaken us, um, a race that has been oppressed uh, but has been liberated by the blood of, of Jesus Christ. And yet today, Lord, we still recognize that if we have not given our hearts to you, regardless of the skin color, then we are still in slavery. We are in bondage to our appetites, to our lust, passions, to our attitudes, and today we want liberty and freedom to Jesus Christ. If we are not free, then we're still captive, and that would mean then your death was but in vain. And so we pray that his death will not be in vain for us. We ask that you would give us the liberty that we so desire. Help us to conquer ourselves through the power and the grace of your divine spirit. We ask that you would also help us to be able to give and to show the way to freedom. Uh, pointing men not to the north star, but to the, to the bright and to the morning star. And that as they look to you, then they shall indeed be free at last. Thank you again, Lord, for blessing us. Please keep us this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.